Well, good morning and happy Resurrection Day to all of you. It's great to be here today. Amen? Amen. Well, let's, uh, let's start by proclaiming that He is risen. You ready? He is risen. He is risen indeed. And he is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's stand and praise Him for His resurrection. Just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You Good morning, church family. I am so excited that you're here on Resurrection Sunday, and it's going to be a great day. He is alive. Many of you have come into the worship center, and we are grateful that you're here. But we need you to move toward the center of our sanctuary at this time to provide space for our guests who are here. So would you please just take a moment and slide on in so that we can seat everyone who's wanting to come in and be a part of this service. Once again, we're thankful that you're here this morning, and we especially want to welcome those of you who are online joining us. We're glad that you're here to be a part of this worship service together this morning. 
Happy Easter! Now, would you take just a moment and stand? If you've not greeted someone around you, make certain that you welcome them this Lord's Day. God bless you. <laughs>
Let's continue singing our hallelujahs to him this morning. He lives. The tomb is empty. The angel said to go quickly and tell his disciples. Let's continue to do that this morning. He's alive. See the tomb where he lay. See the stone rolled away. He is risen. He is risen.
is a river of healing where sins are washed in a grave called salvation come and find a new beginning we're alive with the one who is god's risen son jesus christ savior king you have changed This is a resurrection day. Come and see. Come and see that he is risen. You, you won't find the dead here among the living. Walking to the lights of the freedom we've been given. Come and see that he is risen.
Wonderful singing. Thank you, Scott, and praise team for leading us. Third, third worship service that we've been a part of, and each one has been wonderful. Singing and praising at 8 o'clock this morning, this place was packed out. I knew it had to be Resurrection Sunday. I've never seen that many Baptists in one place at 8 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Beyond that, uh, you know, some of those folks don't even think God gets up at 8 o'clock, so... We're just grateful that you're here to be a part of this very special time. He is alive, and he is here present with us. We know that because his Holy Spirit is among us. And he's here to minister. He's here to encourage. He's here to challenge our hearts and our lives. We should never leave a worship service unmoved. We should never come in and leave the same way that we came in. I heard a fellow one time say, we either need to leave mad, sad, or glad, but you need to leave one way and, uh, and move, and we depend on God's Spirit to do that. We're here to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, from the grave. I know in the outside world, the president's focus today is on Trans Visibility Day, which will not deter us in any way from celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. The Bible says that the entrance of your word gives light. In other words, the light of God's word exposes the darkness. And I think every one of us are aware that the days around us are getting darker and darker and darker. But a risen Lord Jesus Christ can guide us through life even in the darkest days that we can experience. We know that with certainty. I want you to turn with me to the book of Colossians chapter 3. And in a moment, I'm going to read, and you'll probably want to look on the screen because I'm actually going to read from Eugene Peterson's translation, which is a, actually a paraphrase called The Message. But whatever scripture you may have brought with you today, I hope that you'll take it and turn there to Colossians chapter 3. How often do you think about heaven well, looking across this uh, generational crowd, I would imagine that that, that uh, actually is a question that uh, would have to be answered by different age groups. Probably those who are younger would not think about heaven a whole lot, about going on to heaven. But many of us who, who are more aged might think about it on a, on a more regular basis. The Bible says that, uh, that it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. We realize that. We understand that. We live around life and we live around death every day, whether it grips us or not. But it is appointed for every one of us physically to pass from this life. 
But where are we going? And what will take place? And, and what will happen? Well, the Bible is an authoritative word on what happens after death. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. We're looking at a passage of Scripture this morning that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Colossae. Even though he may not have actually been in Colossae, he helped to found that church along with other churches that he wrote these epistles to. And he gives them guidance against the backdrop of the day that they were living in. They were facing persecution and trouble because of the Roman Empire. And in that day... Rome was corrupt. There was a lot of things that were going on. They not only had faced paganism, but there was gross immorality at the time of this writing. And when Paul gives this encouragement, he talks about the resurrection, but what the resurrection ought to mean to every believer. And that is that regardless of what we face in this life, that our actual focus is on Jesus Christ. And that's what he says to us in this writing. The Colossian believers were to direct their attention to the head of the church, who is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the theme of this book. Jesus is the center of the circle around which all Christian living revolves. In fact, Paul writes that Christ is the fullness of God. If we believe that Christ died and rose again, something so miraculous to every one of us, should we not focus our attention on what God's Word says to each of us? Paul in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 27 says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. I don't know what your hope may be today, but if you've placed your hope in something that is tangible... It could easily be taken away. We don't have any certainties in this life. We have no real guarantees in this life. That's why the encouragement to these believers was, don't, face your, don't, don't put your hope in simple things that surround you and even the circumstances of life. Put your hope in Christ. I want you to follow along with me, whether you look at the screen or whether you follow in your Scripture as I read this passage of Scripture this morning, as I said from the message, beginning at verse 1 of chapter 3. So if you're serious about this new resurrection life with Christ, act like it. Pursue things over which Christ presides. Do not shuffle along, eyes to the ground, absorbed with the things right in front of you. Look up and be alert to what is going on around Christ. That's where the action is. See things from his perspective. Your old life is dead. Your new life, which is your real life, even though invisible to spectators, is with Christ in God. He is your life. When Christ, your real life, remember, shows up again on earth... You'll show up too, the real you, the glorious you. Meanwhile, be content with obscurity like Christ. He begins this passage in chapter 3 with telling these Colossian believers that they have been raised with Christ. It says, if then you have been raised. Maybe a better translation would be this. Since you have been raised with Christ. And that pertains to every one of us who have put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Since you have put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ, you have been raised with Christ. In the book of Ephesians Chapter 2 and verse 1, the Bible says, You he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world. In this sense, he said, we were once dead in trespasses and sins. What does he mean? We're walking around alive. What does he mean by you were once dead? 
He says you were dead in trespasses and sins. In other words, you were spiritually dead. That's what the Bible tells us. The natural man cannot understand the things of God. Why? Because we are spiritually dead. We are caught up in trespasses, in breaking God's law, and we're caught up in sins. Regardless of our human ability and our human effort to try to get out of that locked-in situation, we cannot escape. We are dead. You can't get any worse than that. We are dead spiritually. But now what Paul says is this. Once you were dead, now you've placed your faith in Christ and you've been made alive. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, in verse 17, that we have been made alive in Christ. And in that sense, if any man or any person be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. In other words, there was a time in which we walked around and lived our lives in sinful, willful behavior. But because of Christ and because of the spiritual life we have in Christ, we are no longer under the dominion of sin, no longer powerless to sin. By the Spirit of God living within us, we have the power to say no to sin and therefore to live unto God. We are raised with Christ. Now, what is he talking about? He's saying that we are raised positionally in Christ. We are raised to the heavenlies in Jesus Christ. We may not think about heaven a whole lot, but we need to think about heaven more because we've been raised. We know that that is our eternal abode. We know that one day we're going to be with the Lord in heaven because of our relationship with Christ. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 14, John says it this way. He says, you have passed from death into life. You've passed from death into life. So we've been raised, and we're to put a focus now on heaven where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. In other words, all authority in heaven and in earth has been placed into his hands. We do not serve a weak Messiah. We do not serve an inept Savior. Jesus Christ at this very moment is at the right hand of God the Father. And one day, one day while all of the earth will unexpectedly in that sense not even be aware, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will come again. He will reign. John says that we were dead in trespasses and sins. So, We've been raised. What are we to do next? Notice this word, seek. It's an interesting word. It is a word that has urgency. It is a desire. It is an ambition. In other words, when we seek the Lord, we're not to seek with some kind of boredom. We're not to seek as though God won't answer our prayer or that he doesn't love us. We are to seek in that sense with excitement about the spiritual things that are in our lives. Now, you know, we understand what it means to seek after things with excitement. Maybe something that you're planning after the service and you're seeking that with excitement. There may be a trip that you have planned. There may be a new job. There may be other things that are going on. And you don't pursue it with boredom. You pursue it with enthusiasm. You pursue it with excitement. You pursue it in a way that it becomes singular in focus. Now, I know that some of you have uh, drawn up uh, your brackets for the, the, the basketball, college basketball uh, championship. And uh, if you're like me, you, you've probably already blown that bracket completely up. Uh, but here's the thing. Anybody who filled out that bracket became interested in those teams. You can rest assured they checked after the scores of the game to find out where they were on that bracket. Who was winning? Who was doing this? Who was doing that? They didn't come to that bracket and said, now, oh, whoa. maybe they did say, oh, woe is me. But, you know, they didn't come to that bracket without some 
excitement. The tragedy today is that within many of our spiritual lives, we don't have that kind of excitement. It's not because God is not in us. He lives within us. But we've become so focused on the things in this world, so focused on the temporal, on the relative, that we fail to realize the glories that we have with the Lord in heaven. And that's exactly where Jesus is. He's at the right hand of God the Father. There are two things that I want you to notice about that. First of all, we're to set our hearts on things above. Matthew chapter 6 verse 19 says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth or rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So let me ask you this morning, where is your heart? Where is your affection? Where is it that you desire, that your love is most drawn to this morning? The writer of Scripture says that we're to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. We look at the Bible and we see that the heart is referred to oftentimes, and it's really the idea that the heart is the master control of life. It has those affections, but it really is the master control. Wherever your heart is, there is where your affections are going to be. So what is your heart set on? The second thing is this. You're to set your mind on the things of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 14 says this, For the, the love of Christ controls us, because we've concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised again. For you and me as believers, it is no longer simply about me. It's not a narcissistic kind of attitude. It is now about Christ. What is Christ's purpose for me? What is Christ's plan for me? What is Christ's desire? How does God want to use my life? What does Christ want to do with me? When I set my thoughts on things above, my mind on things above, it revolutionizes my thinking. You know why? Because most of us get our news on social uh, advertisements of various kinds, social media. Or maybe we get it on the internet or, you know, somewhere, maybe YouTube, or we find it along the way. And, and what happens is that every day we're bombarded with lots of negative messages. A lot of times just garbage. We feed that into our minds and we feed it into our thought lives. And, and that takes a, a control over our affections and our desires. Think about this. When you begin to filter all of that kind of news through the Word of God, you begin to have a different attitude toward life and a different attitude toward living life. Because what we know today is very, very temporal, very temporal. But what the Bible deals with is eternal. What the Bible has to say to you and to me is everlasting. And God's Word is true. We understand that. So regardless, our thinking plays into it. J.B. Lightfoot said it this way. You must not only seek heaven, you must also think heaven. Not only seek heaven, we need to be thinking heaven. John MacArthur in his commentary said that the believer's whole disposition should orient itself toward heaven just as a compass needle orients itself toward the north. To be preoccupied with heaven is to be preoccupied with the one who reigns there and his purpose, his plans, his provisions, and his power. It is also to view things and people, events of this world, through his eyes and with an eternal perspective. So you see, it really says to us that our focus is not on the next appointment. Our focus is not on our illness. Our focus is not on the next purchase we might be wanting to make. It is to allow our preoccupation with heaven to govern our earthly responses. 
So what we see happening in this life, we have another evaluation from heaven to be able to interpret what may be going on in this world and in this life and in my life and what God may have planned and prepared for me. That's exactly what Paul is trying to do. He is trying to turn these Colossian believers to look toward heaven because they are under persecution. They're under heavy persecution at the time. I want you to notice that the second point is this. You're identified with Christ, which is in verses 3 and verse 4. He says, you've died and your life is hidden in Christ with God. So you died and you were identified with Christ in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And now you're hidden with Christ. In other words, your death is behind you. Oh, yes, you may die physically, but you become alive spiritually the moment that you pass from this life as a christian you go to be with the lord the apostle paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with the lord i think about that just for meditate on that just for a moment to immediately be in the presence of the lord with all of the glories of heaven hard for us to imagine today isn't it maybe that's why our meditation needs to be more focused on what God has planned for those that love him. Our most glorious experiences as Christians await us. They await us. I want you to notice this. He says you've died. In Galatians chapter 2 verse 20, Paul said to the Galatian believers, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. Now we stop there just for a second. If I've died and been crucified with Jesus Christ, if I was crucified when he was crucified, if I was raised when he was raised, if I'm dead, if I'm dead to my life, I no longer live my own life, but I let Christ live through me. Now, believe me, we don't become perfect. We're not going to be that sanctified in that sense, but here's the point. Our life becomes more focused on him than this world. Our life becomes more focused on his purpose, his glories, his joys, his peace, his happiness in our lives when we turn toward him. We died to an old way of living. And now we've been raised to a far superior life. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Not only have you died, but you have been raised. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 12, he says, having been buried with him in baptism. Most of us have seen a water baptism. It's a symbol. It's a symbol of what the Holy Spirit does When we are brought into Christ, we have been buried with Christ. By that symbol of baptism, we've plunged all the way under the water. But then when a person comes out of the water, they are raised to walk in a newness of life. Not after the pattern of the old nature. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith, in the the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Spiritually, you've been made alive. Spiritually, you can commune with God. Spiritually, you can walk in fellowship with him. But he says something else. He uses the word hidden. You were hidden with Christ. In John chapter 10, verse 28, the Bible says, I give to them eternal life, And they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. I and my Father are one. What does it mean to be hidden in Christ? First of all, it means that we are safe and we are secure. For a person who has truly placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, their salvation cannot be taken away. Did you hear what Jesus said? Nothing shall pluck them out of my hand. The devil can't even take them out of my hand. They are safe. They are secure. Those who know Christ. Now, for those of us who are in Christ, living in the world that we're living in, that's a great comfort. 
He's not going to abandon you. He's not going to leave you. He's not going to run from you. You are safe with him. Your life may be taken, but you are safe because you have eternal life. You have life with him. You are hidden with Christ in God. And when you die physically, you're, you're going to be buried. But when you die in Christ, you're going to be seated in the heavenly realm. Now, for many of us, that's a great mystery. And Paul talks about that mystery in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It is a mystery because we've not passed that way before. But you know something? Jesus did. Jesus hung on the cross until he was dead. They took him down from the cross and he had no life in him. He was dead. He had made the full payment for your sin and my sin. He cried out, it is finished. It is finished. What was finished? Everything that needed to be done in order that you and I could be saved, redeemed, forgiven. That's not automatic. You've got to place your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ as a personal Lord and a personal Savior. But he finished the work. Then Paul goes on to say, and one day you're going to appear with him. And you're going to appear with him in glory. In Job chapter 19 and verse 26, Job said this, And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God. Philippians chapter 3 verse 21, but our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body by the power that enables him even to subject all things unto himself. Jesus died, rose again, ascended to the Father and one day will return. Christ will return. And on that day, what was hidden is going to be revealed. What was hidden is going to be revealed. None of us have any kind of guarantee about tomorrow. But we do know this. We will die physically. We will either die physically or we will be here for the rapture of the church. At that point where Jesus Christ will descend from heaven to receive his church unto himself before the tribulation period. It is a powerful thought. The Bible says that we will have that revealed, that we will be with him. In the first church that I pastored, one of the deacons of the church was actually a barber or a hairstylist. And uh, being a deacon of mine, I felt like that I needed to give him my business and, and go and let him cut my hair. And so I wished I hadn't done that because I, I went and let him cut my hair. And then I felt kind of obligated, you know, I needed to go back. But I told him how I wanted my hair cut, and he cut it the way he wanted to cut it. But that's, that's a story for another day. <laughs> he was a good man, a good soul. In his barbershop, he had chairs set up. And he had those chairs facing a wall of mirrors so that as people were getting a haircut or hairstyle, whatever they were getting, they could watch him as he uh, cut their hair. And behind him on the wall was a painting that he had done. And that painting was a rapture of the church so that whoever sat in that barber chair if they looked at themselves, had to look back at that back wall and they had to see that painting. And most of the time it opened the conversation. What in the world is that? What it was a picture of is Jesus descending out of the heavens. And it showed people who were ascending into the heavens to join him and people coming out of the grave to join him. It showed people coming out of automobiles. Some people stayed in the automobile. They weren't going. Some people were in their homes. They weren't going. They stayed. Others came out of their home. But it was a picture of what would happen at the rapture of the church as it took place. 
And so it opened the conversation for him to be able to share with people exactly what that was. And then for him to be able to say, do you know Christ? Are you certain for heaven? Do you have that assurance? It would be tragic today to come and celebrate what God has done in Jesus Christ and leave here not knowing Christ. I want to ask you, have you placed your faith and your trust in Jesus? I'm not asking you, are you religious? Do you go to church? Do you good, do good deeds? I'm asking, has there been a time in your life where you realized, I'm a sinner. I've missed the mark. I need forgiveness. I need life transformation. And by your own commitment, you said, Lord Jesus Forgive me. Come into my life. Be my personal Lord and my personal Savior. And give to me the gift of eternal life. You see, the Bible says there's only one way that a person can get to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And no person comes unto the Father but by me. If you're attempting to come in any other way, you may be really sincere. But according to the Bible, you're sincerely wrong. I want you to bow your heads with me in prayer. Whether you're in this auditorium or whether you're watching online, if you've never trusted Christ, there's not a better opportunity than today to do so. If you sense that God's Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart and you realize that you're a sinner and you would like to receive Jesus, you would like to turn from your sin, I'm going to ask you to pray right there where you are silently. Pray this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, I confess to you that I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. I repent of my sin and turn from my sin. And I place my life in your hands, Lord Jesus. Give me the gift of eternal life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to ask you to stand this morning. If you've made that decision and God speaks to you about making that public, we had two in the early service come and make their commitment to Christ. Maybe you would do that today or you're here as a family or a single adult or a young person and God would lead you to be a part of this church, to place your life right here. You could fellowship with us and grow with us. If God leads you to do that, maybe even to recommit your life to the Lord. Would you do that right now? I'm going to be standing right here at the front and our team is going to lead us in singing and I invite you to come. God sent his son They called him Jesus He came to love Heal and forgive He bled and died To buy my pardon An empty grave is there to prove My Savior lives Because He lives I can face tomorrow Because He lives All fear is gone Because I know He holds the future And life is worth the living Just because He lives I'd like to ask our men to come forward to receive the offering at this time and as they do, let's go to the Lord in prayer and Clint's going to lead us. Let's pray. Pray with me. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for allowing us to 
come into your house and worship you today. Lord, thank you for giving us the opportunity to worship you through song. And Lord, giving us the opportunity to worship you through opening your word and studying the word that you have given us. Lord, thank you for Pastor Rick and how he uh, brings that to us every week. And Lord, I just thank you for now as we come to this time of uh, tithes and offerings that we would be thankful for the opportunity to give back to you a portion of what you've given to us so freely, Lord. And Lord, we're just so thankful today that, uh, that we celebrate a risen Savior. Lord, thank you for living through us. Help us to help us to spread your gospel throughout this earth, Lord. And I pray that the, the tithes and offerings that we raise this morning would do just that, that we would be able to spread the, your gospel throughout this earth. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.